As students, we learn from the textbook cases. What do you think the textbooks say about the prognosis after a fall out of a five-story window? I'll tell you what they say. It's not very good. I know this because it was said to me. On January 11, 2011, I began the day as a freshman Division I swimmer at Georgetown University. By the end of the day, I was laying in a trauma center, paralyzed from the waist down, with doctors unsure if I would ever walk again. No one likes to hear that their life is no longer going according to plan. And while we can't change what happens to us, we can change how we respond, how much we innovate to make the most of what is left, and how determined we are to overcome an obstacle. I was standing on my desk in my dorm room, trying to open the window and get a little more leverage, as my roommate and I had done a hundred times, but this time I slipped and fell out, five stories to the ground. I landed on my feet, but in the process shattered multiple bones, including my L2 vertebrae in my spine. I instantly lost nearly all movement and feeling in my legs. After three surgeries to fuse my shattered spine and heel bones, I came back home to Philadelphia for five weeks of inpatient therapy at Jefferson's own McGee Rehabilitation Hospital. This was not exactly how I thought I'd be spending my freshman year of college. <laughs> but hey, at least I didn't gain the freshman 15. I actually lost 30 pounds of muscle. <laughs> but so began the grueling process of adapting to my new body. My therapists were constantly coming up with new ways to try and get any sort of activity out of the damaged nerves in my legs. And this led to, te to techniques that they never learned in school. One day, they spent their lunch break modifying this standing table so that I could work on weight bearing while also keeping my broken right foot safely off the ground. Not only did this aid my recovery, but it showed me firsthand the dedication of these therapists. They were willing to give up their lunch break to think of something new for me, their patient. This, I thought, this is the kind of healthcare professional that I want to be someday. When I returned home to my parents' house to continue to recover, my home physical therapist took a well-known principle that babies can crawl before they walk and applied it in a new way. Why can't a 19-year-old learn to crawl before she walks again? But babies don't have to drag heavy air casts behind them, and though I had a tiny bit of movement in some of my muscles by now, my atrophied legs were too weak to move with the friction of the boot on the ground. So, our solution? My mom ransacked our laundry room and found furniture movers. And when we put these under my feet, I was able to crawl in circles around our family's house, thrilled to be moving again, even if I wasn't yet upright. All of these seemingly simple ideas culminated into a rigorous rehab program that kept me motivated, but most importantly, gave me the best possible chance of regaining function in my legs. And slowly but surely, my paralyzed muscles continued to wake up. Exactly three months after my injury, I stood up and took my second set of first steps. I began a rigorous outpatient rehab program at McGee, six hours a day, five days a week. We're here, I did evidence-based therapies like locomotor training, which uses a harness to hold up some of your body weight, as therapists used their hands to move your feet on a treadmill, retraining your brain's neural pathways on a gait pattern. I also did some non-traditional therapies, like training with a Division I athletic team. I returned to Georgetown for my sophomore year and rejoined the swim team, where swimming really took the place of all my other physical therapy. Swimming's a total body workout to begin with, and when you combined our team's two-hour workouts in the pool with strength training and conditioning, well, if this wasn't gonna get my legs back to normal, I thought, nothing was. Throughout that year, I got stronger and faster, but it soon became clear that no matter how hard I worked, some of this weakness in my legs was going to be permanent. I would never be competitive at the collegiate level. I still wanted to compete, I wanted to win. And this path led me to Paralympics. Where here, I saw firsthand that with a little creativity, sports, including elite competitive sports, 
were off limits to no one. My Paralympic teammates, all of whom have a permanent physical disability, constantly inspired me with their persistence to find a way to not only to compete, but to excel. Take Amy Purdy, for instance. At just 19 years old, Amy lost both of her legs below the knee to bacterial meningitis. She was determined to find a way to snowboard again, but at the time, there simply were no prosthetics that were compatible with her limbs and a snowboard. She could have given up or tried a different sport. But instead, Amy created her own prosthetic feet, at times using duct tape to hold her prototypes together. She then went on to advocate for snowboarding to be included as a Paralympic sport, and in the 2014 Paralympic Games in Sochi, Russia, in snowboarding's inaugural event, Amy won the bronze medal. Tatiana McFadden was born with spina bifida and doesn't have the use of her legs, but that hasn't stopped her from becoming one of the most successful track athletes in Paralympic history. Using only her arms, Tatiana can finish a marathon in under an hour and 43 minutes. She can go up to 20 miles an hour, again, using only her arms. Wheelchair track athletes like Tatiana need a wheelchair that maximizes their efficiency, and that's where BMW came in. BMW used 3D scans to analyze these athletes as they were competing and identify main areas of drag. And they then created customized cockpits that drastically streamlined the athletes' positions and used carbon fiber to create wheelchair frames that weighed less than 15 pounds. Using this $25,000 chair in Rio, Tatiana won four gold and two silver medals, earning the title of best female athlete of the games. I became so inspired by these stories of persistence that I knew that the Paralympics were something that I wanted to be a part of. So I deferred my acceptance to the fabulous Sydney Kimmel Medical College and trained full time in pursuit of winning my own gold medal. I knew that if I could survive the pain of shattering my spine, of course I could survive the pain of pushing myself through intense workouts every day. Now, a lot of training for an elite sporting event is about good, old-fashioned blood, sweat, and tears. And trust me, there was plenty of that. But to truly be able to give yourself the best possible chance of maximizing your athletic potential when it matters the most, you have to look at every aspect of performance. Take recovery, for example. I use the WHOOP, a performance tracker, kind of like a fancy Fitbit, that provides recovery statistics and training guidelines for athletes. By looking at heart rate variability, sleep, and exertion, the WHOOP's app is able to provide feedback to coaches so that they can schedule their athletes' hardest workouts when they're the most recovered. And just like for wheelchair track athletes, minimizing drag is essential in swimming. I worked with a swimsuit company to refine the fit of their competitive swimsuits to allow for strategic compression of muscle groups to minimize fatigue during racing. And for a while, I didn't really prioritize the mental aspect of training. But after getting frustrated that it didn't seem like my work in practice was paying off in meets, I began to work with a sports psychologist who recommended meditation. Now, you might have heard of Headspace, a guided meditation app, and for me, Using the different modes and features of this app allowed me to create a customized meditation program that taught me to quiet my doubts and prepare my body to excel. All of the pieces of this puzzle came together at the 2016 Paralympic Games in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. My first race was the 100 meter freestyle. I came in and I touched the wall and I looked up to the scoreboard and saw that I had won the gold medal and set a world record. I went on to win another gold medal. <laughs> Thank you. Another gold medal in the 50 meter freestyle, as well as silver and bronze medals in relays. Finding Paralympics gave me opportunities, like this one, that I never would have had had I not gone through the tragedy of falling out of a five story window. It was only because of the challenges I faced that I learned to tap into my full potential. I knew what it was like to lose the ability to walk, to swim, to live independently, 
And I vowed to be grateful for every opportunity that came my way. Seeing the unlimited potential of people with disabilities has inspired me to become a physician that works with this very patient population. Medicine spurs creativity, as the unique abilities and limitations of each human body beckon us to adapt, both as physicians and patients. Dr. Christopher McCullough is a surgery resident at Morristown Medical Center, and he is a perfect example of this. Dr. McCullough has a spinal cord injury and uses a traditional wheelchair to get around most of the hospital. But when it's time to go into the operating room, he uses this customized wheelchair that allows him to be upright while performing surgeries. Stories like these prove that no matter what happens, that we might have to adjust our dreams a little bit, we can still absolutely live the lives we've dreamed of. Now that I've transitioned from full-time athlete to full-time medical student, I draw upon pieces of my experience every day, and I hope to leave you all with three ideas that you can look to going forward. Number one, innovation is everywhere. Innovation doesn't just mean using the latest and greatest technology, although $25,000 wheelchairs certainly don't hurt if you have them. But innovation can be as simple as using objects that you already have in a new way, like using furniture movers to crawl around your house. Not being afraid to color outside the lines can lead to everyday cre creativity that can make a difference in our lives. Number two, the key to success is not a magic pill. It's a culmination of exploring every aspect of performance. And small, consistent efforts in each of these areas add up, and that's what creates a great success. And number three, tragedy can bring out the best in us. We all have a huge reserve of determination and resilience within us, and it's during our most trying times that we're forced to tap into this and find new avenues to become our greatest selves. At one point or another, we will all fall down. For my Paralympic swimming teammate, Morgan Stickney, her fall came in the form of a below-the-knee amputation at just 20 years old due to a rare vascular disease. But for Morgan, her rise is just beginning. Her amputation was performed at Brigham and Women's Hospital using a revolutionary experimental technique that aims to preserve some of the neuromuscular connection between the muscles in the front and the back of the lower leg. The hope is that as prosthetic technology continues to evolve, a robotic prosthetic will be able to integrate with this residual junction. And someday, Morgan could walk with a prosthetic that functions nearly identically to a natural ankle and foot. Adversity created this problem, but it also created the solution. Look into your own life. See where you can utilize new opportunities to reach your full potential, because you never know just how high you may rise. Thank you.